Good morning. We're glad you're with us today. Can't wait to worship with you. Uh, I trust that you've had a good week, and I pray that you have organized your life this morning in a way that is a sanctuary. And I, I say that as a guy with three young boys in the house, and so I want to sympathize right now with the parents who have little little monkeys swinging from chandeliers and jumping off of couches and furniture and things. I'm with you. I get it. I totally understand that. Uh, so as best you can, try to call everyone together today. We're going to take this time just for a couple seconds to quiet our hearts before the Lord. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to sing. But wherever you are, take the posture of worship. This is God's sanctuary. And so we'll worship together here in just a moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this new day in which we have life and the light of Christ. We have your Holy Spirit among us, and God, even though the surroundings are different, this is your sanctuary. Each one who's watching, each one who's worshiping with us right now, God, they're a temple of your Spirit, so we pray, God, come.
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the living room. My name is Mason Brown. I am the community director here at Rio, and we are so thankful that you've joined us this morning for worship, which, by the way, as Ryan said, we know that many of you have got your kids with you in your living rooms, um, and so we want to say hi to all the kids out there. It is great to see you. Uh, parents, uh, I want to remind you that our children's and family ministry here at Rio have put together a ton of excellent uh, resources for you and to help you as a family and to worship together, and not just on Sunday morning, uh, but throughout the week as well. And, and so we want to encourage you to take advantage of those resources, and which you can find either on our app or on our website. Uh, also, I, I want to remind you, uh, another thing I want to remind you about is that Alpha has started. Uh, Alpha is a, a place where you can uh, talk about life's biggest questions as you explore the meaning of life, faith, and God. Uh, from a Christian perspective, uh, without judgment. Uh, it's a place where you can be yourself, where you can uh, say what you think, where you can challenge anything and everything. Uh, and so if you're tuning in with us this morning, or, or maybe you know someone that might be interested in kind of working through the deeper questions of life, invite them or join us for Alpha. Uh, we meet on Thursdays at 7.30 p.m. on a virtual Zoom call. If you go to riovistachurch.com slash alpha, you can learn more on how you can join that call this Thursday at 7.30. We would love to see you there. Also, in this season, when we are kind of together yet apart, we would love to know how you're doing. And I really do mean that. We would love to know how we can be praying for you, how we can come alongside you. And so we want to encourage you, whether this is your first time kind of checking us out, or maybe you've been kind of coming to Rio for a while, we want to encourage you to fill out our Connect card, which you can find either on our app or at our website at riovistachurch.com slash connect. We would love to know how you're doing. And so, with all of those things in mind, before we continue our time in worship, this past week, if you were anything like me, uh, I, found, I, I found myself wishing that I could just press pause on just the responsibilities around the house. Or, or maybe you found yourself wishing that you could just press pause on the demands of work while trying to figure out how to homeschool your kids all at the same time or on the uncertainty of what's coming next. Um, this past week, I, I found myself longing for that sense of rest, uh, and particularly every time I put my son, Jaden, down for a nap. I wish I could make my soul feel the same way that his face looks as he slowly drifts off to sleep, perfectly content and at rest. And I don't know how your week was like for you this past week, but what I do know is that God has given us Sunday morning worship, this opportunity that we have to come together as a community and for Sabbath rest, where we can reset our hearts and our minds uh, to the original pillars of the Creator's heart. And, and so that is what we have come to do this morning. And, and so as we continue our time in worship, uh, let me pray for us. And God, we come before you this morning, and we thank you, Father, for your church that you have gathered. We thank you, Lord, uh, for technology and the way that we can come before you in such a, a unique uh, yet powerful way. And knowing that we are still together, yet uh, apart from one another. And, and Lord, we pray that right now, that by your Spirit, you would peel away our anxieties, uh, the things that are uh, heavy upon our heart. And we pray, Father, by, by the power of your Spirit, as we enter into this time of worship, that you would help us to find our rest, our peace, and solely in you, as we refocus our gaze upon who you are, and upon what you've already done for us in Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Take that posture of worship again, wherever you are. Let's sing to the Lord together. Thank you. 
found myself wanting But there is a well that never runs dry The water of life, the blood of the vine And all I know is everything I have means nothing Jesus, if you're not my one is you right now Just one thing I ask this I will seek
every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me there is no one like you there is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me.
sing through the shadows my song of the sand. Whatever I want to, wherever I am, your name can move mountains wherever I stand. Whenever I walk through the valley of death, I'll sing through the shadows my song of ascent, my song of ascent. praise you, Father, that we can indeed rejoice whether we find ourselves today on the mountaintop or in the valley. Because it was never about how we feel. It was always about what you've accomplished. So God, give us just this sense of rest in your grace today. That we would just cease striving hit the pause button on whatever may be the self-talk, the things of the enemy, that the lies that are whispered in our ears. God, would you help us to identify those things and just make them quiet? These times bring out the best and worst in us in some sense, and so God, we, we bring to you our best and our worst. We pray, God, that you would give us your grace, the ability, God, to, to wake up in the morning and just say, God, here I am. Use me as you see fit. And to allow your spirit, Lord, to lead in our lives. God, wherever people are today, wherever this congregation is, I pray that you would reassure them that uh, that there are people across the earth right now rejoicing and worshiping with them. So even if they find themselves weary today and unable to sing, Lord, I pray that you would give them faith and courage and the knowledge that you have surrounded them with a community of faith that is singing and rejoicing for them. And we long for the day we can be back together again, but Lord, even as we're apart, we pray you would unify us by your spirit. All these things we pray you would do out of your abundant mercy. He who did not spare his own son. God, we call on you to give us as well a sense of your grace and peace today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, at this time in our service, we typically take an offering and we're going to do that right now. Actually, I'm going to give you a minute to take out your phone, your device, whatever it may be that you use to give online. On your screen, you'll see, you'll see a link to how to give. There are different ways you can do that. It only takes a minute to set up an account if you haven't, to put in your information, simple things, and just 
give as an act of worship. You know, that's why we do it as a part of our worship service and not another time in the day or week. It is an act of worship. And, you know, these material things, man, they can find a way to wrap around you and suffocate the life out of you. And that's why God wants us to give. That's why he wants us to surrender these things in worship so that we'll remember who our God is. But if you find yourself today out of work, you're stressed because you don't know where the next electric bill is gonna come from. If you find yourself in some kind of hardship like that, there's also a way that you can reach out to the church for help. It's help at riovistachurch.com. Just email that address and someone will reach out to you. But now I'm gonna give you a minute just to give. And so take out your phone, whatever it may be, and go ahead and surrender that to the Lord. Heavenly Father, would you receive our offerings? Just like the songs we sing, God, we, we offer them not only as material things, as words and songs and money, but God, we give these things to you out of a heart that just longs to be with you, out of a desire for more of your presence. And God, we may give a small portion today of all that you've entrusted to us as stewards, but we pray, Holy Spirit, would you make it firm in our hearts this knowledge and understanding that this little bit represents the whole. What we give today, God, represents it all. So God, we surrender ourselves to you in this way, worship you once again in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. The importance of community is so much more than just fulfilling that need to belong. Secrets straight into your living room. Oh my God. <laughs> It's embedded in the very fabric of who we are. It's a part of our design. And we have been created in the image of a relational God intended for community, not only with God himself, but with each other as well. To be fully human means to live in relationship with others. Um, that's kind of the, the hurdle that I feel like I need to get over. Hmm. We need people with whom we can laugh and cry alongside people with whom we can share life and be known. Yeah, I think uh, I might have mentioned it last week. I kind of feel like it's something that I'm just checking off my to-do list at times. Most importantly, we need people who are intentional in pointing us to Jesus. Community is the source of our life and flourishing in Christ. It is the very vehicle that God has designed where we can be sharpened in our faith as we bring our doubts, questions, and feelings of uncertainty to our community. If there were ever a time to engage and pursue community with others, now is the season. A season where people are experiencing fear, anxiety, sickness, loneliness. We need to stay connected. There is no greater time to join or start a new community group here at Rio than now. Well, here at Rio, uh, we truly believe uh, that we have been created for community, that it's not just this a thing that's a nice to have or something that is optional for us to engage in, but we believe that we are truly incomplete without it. And so here at Rio, we have something that we call community groups, uh, which are small gatherings of people uh, who are intentional in just working through personal worship together and sharing life with one another and maybe even most importantly, in praying for each other throughout the week. And something that we're really, really excited about is that all of our community groups are now virtual. And what that means is this, you are now able to engage in a community group 
from the comfort of your own home. You don't have to go anywhere, which is pretty awesome. All you have to do is just log on. And so we want to invite you here at Rio into a deeper community. And so if you're interested um, in joining a community group, or maybe you're interested in leading a community group, uh, we want to encourage you to go to our website at riovistachurch.com slash community to try to figure out how you can use your gifts or how you can best find a group that best fits you. And so we want to encourage you to take advantage of that. And while our community groups focus on building and strengthening our horizontal relationships with one another, the sermon series that we began last week, When God Prays, focuses on another type of relationship. It focuses on our vertical relationship with God. And if you did your personal worship with us this past week, you saw that one of the many gifts that Jesus gave to us was his prayers his communion with the Father. And so this morning, as we look at Jesus's high priestly prayer, and we're going to explore what it looks like and what it means for us as we pray and to be one with him. And so let me pray for us. And God, we come before you this morning, and once again, we are thankful just for the opportunity uh, to, to gather before you, and, and, and we're thankful, Lord, just for the opportunity to open up your word, that you are a God who speaks. Uh, God, we pray right now that you would be with Matt, that as he uh, preaches your word, that you would speak through him. God, we are thankful, Father, for the promise that you have given to us, that when your word is read, that it does not come back void. And so, God, we pray, Father, that wherever we're at in life, whether we're questioning, whether we have doubts, whether we believe in you, God, we, we pray that right now that you would speak to us by the power of your spirit. And in his name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's actually been a really great exercise to be in this open, empty space throughout the week when we come in here to work on things or whatever. Uh, it's very quiet. And it's big. The chairs are moved out mostly. And there are a lot of places in culture right now, a lot of places in the community where normally if you went there, they would just be abuzz with activity and noise and everything else and horns and all kinds of things. And right now, there's a lot of those places are just quiet including this place. And I'm going to tell you that I swear to you, I hear a voice in here, not a creepy voice. I hear that, I hear that still small voice saying things to me that I've longed to hear. And I want it. I crave it. I need it right now. I want more of it. I want it to speak louder and clearer, and I, 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 I want to I be with it all the time. It sounds to me like the voice of a loving father. You know, I was thinking about that as I was working on this message about prayer. One of the most fundamental metaphors in Scripture that God gives for a relationship with him is that of a father to his children. And I was thinking about my own dad, my own father. Because at the end of the day, Prayer is a conversation between a father and his child that he loves. That's what it is. So I was thinking about the evolution of that conversation between me and my father. And I remember when I was little bitty, and I, I have memories literally when I was real little. And it's so funny. When I try and imagine my dad, I can only imagine him from like the knee down. I can only imagine his charcoal gray business suit pant leg and his shiny black shoes because he was an accountant. And he always had suits on. And that's all I remember about him. And I remember his countenance. Um, it wasn't so much in our conversation. Our conversation wasn't what he said. It's who he was. And that gray charcoal slackened shoe had this bellowing baritone voice. And it was so big and so loud to me. And, and, and it would just go through me. You know, you didn't just hear it. You felt it when you were in his presence. And he had this joyful laugh that he would he would give out, or if he needed to get your attention, uh, he could do it. But all I remember of him in that conversation was kind of like Charlie Brown, you know, wah, 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 wah. I don't remember what he talked about. I just remember that. But then 
But then as I got a little older and I began to actually converse with him with words, of course, what was it? It was a million questions. It was, why this? Why not that? When are we going to go here? When are we going to get there? How do you do this? How do you do that? It was a million questions for my dad because he knew everything. He was God to me. He knew everything about everything in the whole world, and he could fix anything. So it was a lot of questions. But then as I got older, those questions turned to proclamations. I got it, Dad. I can do it. I don't need you to do it, Dad. Let me do it, Dad. But then as I began to experience the freedom of my dad letting me do my own things, I began to also enter into things like Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thanks, Dad, for letting me use the car. Thanks, Dad, for picking me up at soccer practice. Thanks for coming to my game. You know, it was the strangest thing. My dad worked almost 50 miles away from where I went to school. He, he worked north and I went to school south. And to get to my soccer games, he would have to drive all that way in rush hour traffic in Miami. And he would literally come and pull his car up right near the field where he probably wasn't supposed to. And he would either sit in his car or he would go up in the stands. And literally out of all the people, I could hear his voice when he would say, when he would shout out, Dad, thank you for coming to my games. Dad, thank you for going fishing with me at 11 p.m. on a Friday night in the middle of tax season. Thank you, Dad. There were also confessions. You know, and a lot of these confessions are your pretty typical confessions. They're the confessions because you knew you had to confess because there were consequences that he was going to see and figure out if you didn't confess. And so it was, Dad, uh, uh, sorry, I... Uh, put a hole in the raft and got stuck on the sandbar uh, and somebody had to come get me. Sorry, Dad, that I shot a hole in the gun table. That's a whole other story for another day. Sorry, Dad, that I got that ticket, knowing that I would have to pay the ticket. But there was this other kind of confession that I had to do with my dad. It, it was the harder and more profound one. It was the one where I had to confess that I had done something unbecoming of his son. I had done something that did not reflect the character that he had instilled in me, and I knew it. There were confessions. You know what I was? I was my father's project. I was my father's sculpture. He was chipping away at everything he needed to chip away at to raise a son because he loved me. And so the collection of all those things was just the accumulation of one conversation between a father and a child that he loved. That's prayer. And the end of that prayer is the same for you and God as it was for me and my father. God wants you back. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to be one with him. He wants to chip away at everything that doesn't look like the image of God made in you. But you and I were separated from him from the beginning. In the garden, the Bible tells the story of the first son and daughter of God, Adam and Eve. And what happens? It's so beautiful. In verse 8 of Genesis 3, it says, God was walking in the garden. And you know what that tells me? It says he was walking in the garden of Eden in the cool of the evening. It says that they used to go on walks with the God of the universe. But you see, they'd rebelled against their father. They had become a prodigal. They had decided, let me do it, Dad. I can do it. Leave me alone. And in so doing... They learned a hard lesson about good and evil, something they weren't prepared to manage. And what did they do? They hid. All of a sudden, they were ashamed. Do you see what happened? The relationship with their father, this perfect conversation that was natural as breathing, snuffed out, separated. That's why prayer is hard. That's why some of you grew up repeating the same old prayers over and over, and you didn't even know what they meant. It didn't mean anything to you. They just seemed worthless. 
That's why, that's why uh, some of us uh, are embarrassed to pray. We don't know how to pray. It feels weird. We feel like we're praying into outer space. Some of us, um, uh, uh, we're afraid to pray because we really don't think God will answer. We don't, we don't pray expectantly because we don't want to put God on the hook. Some of us are distracted. Every time I try to pray, I close my eyes and I'm thinking of a million things I've got to get done. Or I'm just thinking of nothing. So we have to form habits and we have to set times on our clock and we have to write prayers into our prayer journal. We have to do all these things because prayer is hard. Because why? Because we've been separated from our Father. But he loves us. We're still his project. He's still coming for you. He still still wants to bring you home. But I want to remind you of something. If you're part of this church, and hopefully uh, you will become one if you're not, it is our aim at Rio to become a house of prayer where we can continue praying every morning at 714 and every evening at 714 with Christians around the world. We've continued that project because we want to become a house of prayer. Well, why do we want to do that? Because prayer is the thing that sparks revival. Faithful, expectant prayer sparks revival. And would you not say that right now in this world, of all times we've been alive, we're due for some revival? Another reason is because authentic, expectant prayer moves mountains, Jesus says, even with the faith of a mustard seed. But you know what else it does? Because it doesn't move all the mountains, does it? You know that. It also steals you for the climb when you must climb the mountain. A father disciplines those he loves. A father also helps to guide and strengthen and give wisdom to those he loves who have a journey they must take to fulfill the greater mission. And those are the hard ones. Those are even harder. But most of all, God answers your prayers because he loves you. He answers them with wisdom Yes, no, maybe, wait, because he loves you. Hear me say that. He delights in you. He just likes to be with you. He wants to go fishing with you at 11 o'clock on a Friday night during tax season. Because he's not mad at you. Because Jesus paid the price for all those things. Because he wants you back. In this series... Um, which we've called When God Prays, that one of the greatest things God did to help us with our prayer life is he's actually given us prayers that we've witnessed him give through Jesus on this earth. And one of those prayers that's perhaps the most profound is found uh, at the end of the Gospel of John. It's called the High Priestly Prayer. I want you to hear it. This is just a small part of it. It was in your personal worship this week. I hope you were able to uh, take a look at that. But it's in John 17, starting at verse 10, if you want to look it up. He says to the Father, all mine are yours and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, so that why? They may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you gave me. I've guarded them. Not one of them has been lost except for the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Hear this, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. I do not ask that you move every mountain, but that you keep them from the evil one, from the one who would take them away from you that would destroy their unity with each other and with you. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, make them holy in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself. I set myself apart. I make myself holy for this task. I prepare myself to do what I am about to do on the cross, that they may also be sanctified in truth. And I don't just ask for them. 
I also ask for those, please hear this, brother and sister in Christ. I also ask for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I've given to them, that they may be one as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one. Why, why, why? So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. That's Jesus' mission statement. That's his core competency to maintain his unity with his Father throughout this broken, sinful life so that he could restore your unity with your Father. So it's in that context and through that lens that Jesus tells his disciples that verse that so often gets misused. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. He also tells his disciples, if you have the faith even of a mustard seed, as I said, that you can move mountains. So, very logical question, and a question we've gotten from a lot of you. We asked for prayer questions. We asked for them online and on, on social media, and we asked for them just among our community groups, and we got a lot of great questions, but let me tell you one of the most common ones was, what about those times that it seems so obvious God should move that mountain, and he does not? What gives with these unanswered prayers that seem so obviously noble and good? Why don't the mountains move? And frankly, Matt, here's another one somebody asked me about. This idea that God is my Father is not helpful to me. In fact, it's insulting to me. At least it's confusing and painful because my earthly father has been neglectful or negligent or abusive. I didn't even have one. So don't you tell me that God is my loving Father. It means nothing to me. Well, I want to say two things to that. Three. First, I want to say that I'm sorry. I'm sorry that that's what this life has delivered you. Truly. But I want to say that there's hope because of two other things. The first one is this. How do you know that you had a bad father, if that's all you've known? How do you feel the sense of righteous indignation about being neglected or abandoned or abused by a father? How did you know that wasn't just normal? Well, it's because something beyond this world imprinted on you the image of a good father. Someone the author of love, the one who made you to walk in the garden with him, imprinted on you the vision for a loving father. But there's another reason, even more important and profound than that one, and it is this. No one had a greater claim to, the call, to call his father a deadbeat dad than Jesus himself. Let me say that again. No one had a greater claim to call his father a deadbeat dad than Jesus himself. Jesus who had everything. Jesus who had eternal glory next to his father's right hand was sent to earth to strip himself of all of that glory, to be born to a poor couple in a nowhere town, to become a carpenter on the day he was born. And from then on, people wanted him dead. And it just got worse and his life was surrounded by the temptation to sin. He spent 40 days in the wilderness literally being tempted by the devil himself. He was mocked and accused by religious leaders. His life was a struggle. Even those closest to him would tend to wander and drift and not get it, and he'd have to repeat himself and say, how long is it going to take for you to get it? He lived a life of suffering, a man, of, a, a, a man acquainted with sorrows, it says in these were the cards that Jesus was dealt, and here's what he got for them. Right up until he prayed that high priestly prayer, and the day after, 
He got abandoned by his closest friends. He got arrested for crimes he didn't commit. He got convicted in a corrupt trial. And he got hung on a garbage heap between two thieves while everybody made fun of him and they gambled for his clothes. And they mocked him and they called him king of the Jews and they put a crown made of thorns on his head and he hung there and he suffered. Nobody had a greater claim than Jesus to call his father a deadbeat dad. And right in the middle of all that, he cried out to God with the most noble and logical and reasonable of all prayers. He said this, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he died, in the dark, alone with his disciples asleep, he withdrew, a stone, he withdrew from them a stone's throw, it says, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. No one had a claim to call God a deadbeat dad, to wonder with cynicism if there was anybody on the other end of that line than Jesus. Prayer for us fallen human beings is something Awkward, confusing, frustrating, discouraging. It's a thing we have to talk about and study and practice and remind ourselves to do. And we've all wondered with skepticism if God's listening at all. But here's the thing. Jesus, above all, knew what it meant for God to say no. The biggest tragedy that Jesus faced For our rebellion against God was separation. It wasn't the pain of the nails or the thorns or the sword or the bitterness of the vinegar. It wasn't even the weight of the sins of the world. It was that moment when Jesus cried out to God and said, Why have you forsaken me? He said, Father, move this mountain. And his father said, I cannot. You've got to climb this one. And you've got to climb it alone. And he sent him an angel to give him strength, but even that angel couldn't keep his blood from turning to sweat, sweat at the stress, or from his sweat to turning to blood at the stress. He did that so that you and I could be reconciled with him. He took on that separation and that isolation and that lostness, and he heard that father say no. He says those things. But here's what he does with those things. You see, what Jesus did is he trusted his father with his suffering, with his sacrifice, and with his death. And what did he get in return? Resurrection. That's the gospel. Trust Jesus, not just with your victories, not just with your life that's going well. Trust him with your suffering. Trust him with your sacrifice on his mission. Seek his mission out. Trust him even unto death. Because we know through Jesus, who suffered the isolation and separation from him, that the promise to you is resurrection. And that is the best answer to any prayer ever prayed. Papa, we're all on various degrees of that journey right there, feeling something other than weird, calling the God of the universe Papa. But that's what you want us to call you, and it's what your son Jesus said on the cross. He called you Papa. So my prayer for everybody out there right now, for everybody in here, is that you would open your hearts and minds and you would establish those habits in your life to restore those, that communication, not with, just with God your creator, God your provider, but with your papa. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Would you stand with us as we close in worship? Stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I 
benediction from the book of Romans. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.